Hello, everybody. I am Jeremy Jauncey. My pronouns are he, him. Welcome to the WWF's The Green Room, a space where we talk about all things related to the climate crisis. We learn about the incredible work being done by the organization and what each of us can do to help prevent the worst impacts of a warming world. Uh, you may recognize me, my background. I'm the founder and CEO of Beautiful Destinations. We are one of the largest travel and tourism communities in the world on social media. Every single day, over 30 million people turn to us to be inspired about travel and tourism we use that platform um, to push the messages of sustainable and regenerative travel and really talking about how impactful the tourism industry is and our very passionate belief that travel and sustainable travel is a force for good in the world so today i am very fortunate to be joined by WWF's Anita Van Breda and Janelle Palmer. Um, we'd like to start maybe with an introduction to both of these amazing ladies so Anita please let us know who you are love to meet you Thank you, Jeremy. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you so much for lending your voice to this issue. So I'm Anita Van Breda. I'm the Senior Director for Environment and Disaster Management here at World Wildlife Fund based in Washington, D.C. My background is actually in marine and coastal conservation, working primarily in the Caribbean and the South Pacific. But I joined ODAF in 2002, working first on marine issues in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia. And then in 2005, I shifted to develop the program that I lead now on environment and disaster management. So we're part of the adaptation and resilience program here within the climate program of WWF. Amazing. Well, very, very excited for our upcoming conversation. Um, Janelle, equally excited to meet you. Maybe if you could introduce yourself to, uh, to everyone that's watching. For sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Janelle Palmer. My pronouns are she, her, hers and I'm a graduate student studying natural resource management and sustainable development at American University and the University for Peace in Costa Rica. But my background is actually in refugee resettlement in the US. Uh, so I'm in this place where I'm connecting climate change and climate change response and displacement. It's a really interesting intersection and it's very much brought me to the world of humanitarian response and disaster response. I had the opportunity to intern with WWF and the Environment and Disaster Management team this summer, where I got to learn about disaster risk reduction um, and building back better and what some of the environmental implications are of restoring a community. So I'm really excited about everything we're talking about, and it's a really wonderful field. Fantastic. Well, before we start, um, on behalf of so many millions of people around the world, a massive thank you to both of you and to the WWF at large for all the amazing work uh, that you do. Really, it is such critical work in the world that we live in today. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a topic that really is impacting so many of us around the world today, and that is the consequences and impacts of natural disasters that have been exasperated by climate change. And we've certainly seen in the media in the last 12 months, um, it's been going on for much, much longer, but particularly in the last 12 months, um, the rise in extreme events like hurricanes and wildfires and earthquakes and just the devastating impact it has, um, the loss of life, destroyed homes, displayed families, um, not even to mention the, the negative impact that it has on, on physical spaces, animals and ecosystems. And, and so maybe if we start with that as, a, as an overarching um, macro theme, Anita would love to hear a little bit about your, your perspective, WWF's perspective uh, and the work that you're doing in disaster management. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, for some people, it's a little bit unusual to think about an environmental group like WWF working on disasters. But over the years that I've been doing this, it's become pretty clear that there are several aspects of disasters that have a direct impact on our conservation. So for example, extreme events like hurricanes, storms, they represent often um, significant physical damage and destruction to forests, to coastal resources, to sand uh, dunes and wetlands and coral reefs. So there's a physical destruction. Second, they often displace large numbers of people and those people have to go somewhere and often they go to parks and protected areas where there is space for people to move to temporarily. Um, third, they often set off a sudden and massive demand for building materials. Um, so a sudden demand, for example, for timber that comes from forests or sand and gravel and mud and clay that's needed for bricks and concrete blocks. So we have to remember we're often trying to rebuild in a number of months or years what may have taken generations to build 
in the first place. And so, again, that's a sudden uh, significant demand for building materials. And that, of course, has an environmental um, impact. Um, secondly, or thirdly, or fourthly, they can also um, injure or kill endangered species. So that is a significant impact as well. Um, and then they can change priorities for conservation. If you're working on one special area or with one special species and it gets hit pretty hard or wiped out by an extreme event, that of course uh, causes us to, to shift our conservation priorities. So within WF and within our program, we tend to look at this issue from multiple perspectives as well. And so uh, one is we know that um, a degraded environment represents more risk for people. So if we want to reduce disaster risk for people, we have to look at what are the environmental conditions that those folks are subjected to. So the environment can play a significant part in disaster risk. Then when an extreme event happens, the rebuilding process uh, also needs to include the environment. If we want to rebuild communities that are healthy and safe and productive, then we need a healthy and safe and productive environment as part of that process. And then our third intervention point is, of course, climate and climate change and working on that issue from both a risk perspective as well as uh, how do we rebuild and recover post-disaster. Thank you, Anita. It, it really is so helpful to get your, your macro view because I think not many people really understand quite how interlinked all of these pieces are and the work of WWF is is so all-encompassing looking at all of these different factors that, that probably don't immediately spring to mind but uh, Janelle I know in, in your field Anita touched on uh, the restoration work that WWF does and that's something that you've done research on and you, you have some expertise in so would love to hear from you um, a little bit of your experience and your perspective. Of course. Um, I think when we think about recovering from a disaster like a hurricane or a flood, we think not just about the people and their safety and what can be done to help, but also what happened to their homes, what happened to the towns that they lived in and the places where they were able to connect, build relationship and memories and community together. And so that's really how infrastructure becomes a part of this when restoring and rebuilding homes and schools and other important buildings and then bridges and roads, other infrastructure is so important, not just to restoring the physical community, but also to restoring the the identity of the community. We need a lot of resources, but another really big one is concrete. And what a lot of people don't know is that sand is a key ingredient in concrete. And actually sand is a finite resource with some pretty wild social and environmental implications associated with it. Sand is actually the most used resource in the world because it's in infrastructure and construction like concrete and cement but also glass, it's used in silicon, and it's used in energy production processes. So we have a huge demand for sand as a global population, so much so that we use something like 50 billion tons annually, and black markets, illegal sand mines, wow. and even sand mafias have developed around this resource as part of something called the global sand crisis. A lot of people haven't heard about that, but it's happening all around the world. Sand for construction has to come from waterways or the ocean. Not, um, desert sand is too smooth, actually, so they can't use it for building codes um, or due to building codes. So it's always happening on river, in riverways, along coasts, or in the ocean, which means that communities, which are riverside or coastal, face the consequences of sand mining. There are a lot of impacts associated with sand mining, both environmental and political and social, but um, for the sake of talking about restoration, one of the big impacts is that sand mining impacts dunes, it impacts beaches and banks. So the sand mining actually either removes the sand or causes the sand to erode. That doesn't only destroy the natural beauty of these places, which is so important to the communities, but also actually takes away the key ecosystem service that those banks and beaches provide, which is protection from extreme weather events like storm surges or flooding. So it's a really interesting cycle where after disaster happens, there's such a high need for sand to rebuild that infrastructure because of the need for cement and other parts of, of construction. But we also see sand mining in the adjacent areas causing more vulnerability to those communities because they're losing some of that natural protection. 
So when we're talking about building or rebuilding a community, we can't just be restoring the community here and now. It has to also be restoring the community in the future. Add climate change into that and the extreme weather events that are associated with warming temperatures, and you see that we really have something we need to think carefully about. There's these high probability of, of hazards happening and vulnerability along coastlines due to sand mining, so there's a likelihood for disaster. So when we're going into a community to rebuild, we need to be thinking about future resilience, not just current building of uh, the community's places. Thank you, Janelle. It's, it's incredibly insightful. I, it's a perspective I'd, I'd never ever considered. I think there probably aren't that many people who'd be aware that there is a global sand crisis and, and certainly we're making the situation worse with every national event. So, so thank you, thank you for, for sharing that. I think as we think about this wider recovery and restoration piece, we, we can't really ignore this, this critical challenge, Anita, that I know you're so well versed in, which is actually looking and understanding how do we plan for these increases in hurricanes and these increase in wildfires that we've been seeing in recent years? Yeah, Jeremy, that's so important. And just to follow up on Janelle's discussion about sand, we were so lucky to have her with us this summer to help on this work. Uh, DOTAF um, has been working on the sand crisis for a little over two years now. We have some great partners and we're planning to continue in the future. We really do need to work together to solve it and raise awareness. So I'd be thrilled for you and your colleagues and friends to visit the website and learn more about what we're doing on sand and get involved because we're going to need everybody um, and it's those sometimes Absolutely. those you know under the radar hidden issues that set up risk for communities and so we do with the increasing amount of extreme events that are happening we do need to be you know, mindful as individuals as communities uh, within our own homes and families that um, you know risk is really a function of exposure and hazards and vulnerability. So in the rebuilding process, for example, post-disaster, it's not okay to just displace that risk elsewhere to another community. We really have to think you know, collectively about where risk and exposure is presented and who is vulnerable and how and why and fold that into our um, rethinking about planning for and responding to disaster. So one thing that we've been working on over the years is to, for example, include these environmental parameters in disaster impact assessments. So when disaster impact assessments take place, we look at who has been hurt or displaced and why and how and uh, what those people need to rebuild, what sorts of infrastructure has been impacted. But we also need to look at the environment as as, an, as another asset that needs to be assessed and evaluated and then built into the rebuilding and recovery plans. So that's one thing that we really need to continue to, to work to mainstream. Secondly, we need to train people. Um, if we're training humanitarians, disaster management, local communities on how do you include the environment as part of disaster management, they're going to be better placed to deal with um, future risk. And then thirdly, from our perspective, we need to mainstream this into policy. Uh, so it becomes part of the institutional framework for uh, managing disaster risk. And we've been doing those things for the last 15 years, trying to make it more mainstream, make policies clear, then train people, how do you put those policies into action? Because just having policies sitting on the shelf is great, but not exactly as useful um, as we need it to be. And then again, including the environment as part of the fundamental part of understanding what has happened and what do we need to do to rebuild safer for the future. Absolutely. Now, when you look through that lens, uh, Anita, what, what kinds of communities are most at risk from these types of events? Well, I think, Jeremy, the truth is that none of us will be able to escape climate change and the impacts right. of climate change. We're really all um, at risk. Uh, some of us, though, have different choices, different options, different financial resources. Um, so we could move away from risk or take a job somewhere else and just do our work online. That's not true for everyone. So we need to be really mindful of thinking about risk, risk reduction and rebuilding with equity and justice as part of that process. And we need to have a collective um, sense of doing this as as a whole of society approach and it's not just every individual's decision on where they live and how they live and how they can reduce risk uh, but we need to do it as part of a, a collective action 
and take responsibility within our own decisions and the decisions that we make, what we do with our families, what we do with our communities, as well as the private sector and government. It's got to be a whole of society approach. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's why conversations like this are so important to me and I feel so honored to get to talk to, to people like you who can educate me and then we can use this messaging to kind of get out to a, to a wider audience and, and educate people because certainly I feel like I've, I've learned so much in these last sort of 10, 15 minutes of discussing that I never would have known had we not been able to plug into um, sort of insights and, and resources like uh, like you guys as uh, someone it's so attractive that someone behind you is coming to listen as well so there we go um, but uh, <laughs> how how do you advise individual people can prepare uh, you know in advance of disasters like this yeah I think um, we have to make our own uh, as individuals and again as families do you have an emergency plan for your family do you have a communication plan do you know where to go do you have the resources that you would need to take if you need to leave at a moment's notice if a fire or a flood suddenly comes? You know, get prepared. Don't think it's not going to happen to me um, because it could uh, very much so. Um, so we're all at risk. We all need to pre prepare ourselves, our families, our communities. Um, but then also, you know, demand of your local institutions, your local government disaster management agencies, park services. Uh, environmental groups ask them what are you doing to help reduce to help reduce disaster risk are you including the environment as part of that because that is important because the more that we demand that the more institutions our actors will um, will respond to that and, and start to address it as well now can you, can you think of any organizations or humanitarian groups that we might be able to look at ourselves or, or learn from or anyone that's really doing the right kind of thing in the space at the moment well, I think, Jeremy, since I've been doing this work, uh, I've seen a big change um, in attitude and approach by disaster management agencies, both government and, and nonprofit. When I started, it was a real uh, shock to them that an environmentalist was interested in this, and they didn't see the connection. But honestly, I've been so delighted that over the last 15 years, that attitude has shifted. Um, environment or Humanitarian groups like Red Cross, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, Practical Action, they all are working to include the environment as part of their policies and their approaches. We applaud them with that. We support them in doing those policy development processes, but we're also partnering with them to, again, to train their staff, to train their volunteers. How do you put this policy into practice in a real practical way on the ground, in the field, so to speak, to make a difference? for the people in the environment that we, that we care about. So again, I'd say, ask your local community group, ask your local Red Cross office, encourage them uh, to be mindful of this, uh, to put it into practice and then get out there and do it and help them, help them do it too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very encouraging to hear that, um, obviously you have so much experience and you see that there is a positive shift certainly in, in awareness and action. I think we certainly live in a world where there really aren't very many consumers left who don't understand quite how critical this, this is. I think the media has certainly told us the narrative about how, how challenged we are today, but it sounds as though if there are areas of encouragement and, and hope, uh, maybe we could shine a light on that. So if either of you have any examples or any thoughts about what give you hope in this situation, I'd love to, I'd love to hear that perspective as well. Maybe Janelle, if, if we start with you, we haven't heard from you for a little while. Um, I think honestly, when I first started studying this field, it, it can be overwhelming. It can feel like there isn't a lot of hope, but once you start to learn the organizations are really doing good work and innovative new things, trying new things, and what people groups have been living with the environment without problem for millennia, and sort of analyzing what systems aren't working and seeing what systems could, you start to see that somewhere in our collective knowledge there are answers. Um, and I think collective is such an important word there, collective knowledge and collective action. Uh, I, I feel a lot of hope when I see people of different backgrounds, of different experiences, even opposing backgrounds and experiences, trying together to try to create something different. I think that's when 
we see the most creativity and the most innovation coming up. So I think maybe unity is a good word for, for the hope I feel when I um, when I think about these these crises. Because they are big, you look at the climate crisis, even from my back to the refugee crisis, those are connecting. There's so many new things happening, um, but there's also a lot of people who, who are noticing, who care, and who want to make the world better. So um, I bring a lot of hope back. Amazing. Thank you. I don't need to yeah. on your side. Yeah, there are a couple of things that give me hope, Jeremy. Like Janelle Saudik, it can feel overwhelming when you work in climate change on a day-to-day -day basis. But a couple of things come to mind. One is, I think we know what we need to do. Right? It's not a mystery. We need to reduce or eliminate our carbon pollution as quickly as possible, as much as possible. That's just fundamental, and it's it's a reality. So that's one thing. We know what to do. Secondly, we know, and, we're, and there's increasing recognition now, that we need to adapt to, to the climate impacts that we're already seeing and that we know are gonna come even with the best climate mitigation. And we need to adapt in a way that we're working with nature and not against nature as part of that adaptation. And that is becoming more recognized and put into action now. Um, and then thirdly, as, as Janelle said, I think there's more recognition that we need collective action. This is just not an environmental problem to solve. This is a whole society problem. It involves healthcare workers, educators, teachers, lawyers, communicators, journalists, filmmakers, engineers, hydrologists. Everyone has a role to play. And every decision that we make as individuals and as professionals has a carbon or climate impact. So really encourage people to think about what can you do as an individual? And then what can you do as part of this collective action and get out there and do it? Just try it, do it. Amazing, amazing. That is that is really the perfect way to, to wrap. I think we're coming up on time. Very, very inspiring words. Um, thank you both so much for, for your insight, for your time. Um, going back to where I started again, just a, a huge thank you for all the work that you're doing um, and obviously for the WWF um, at, at large. Uh, I know there's people watching who, who I hope will have learned a lot. I learned a huge amount from this and, uh, and great, greatly appreciate the time and really hope we get a chance to speak again. But um, thank you so much both. Thank you for your, your thoughts. Thank you, Jeremy. It's great talking to you. Bye now.